your grace that lingers with us. We are here today, Lord, and we ask that you will allow your Holy Spirit to be with each one of us. First, God, uh, for you to fill our vessels, we ask, first of all, that you will empty us of all the things that are unlike you so that you will be able to fill our vessels with the Holy Spirit. As we move forward into the other section of our worship service, we ask that you will remove self from us. We ask, Lord, that as we come to you as the clay before the potter, God, we ask that you will mold us, you will fashion us, remove from us all those impurities so that at the end of this worship service, we can attest that it was good to be here and we have been with you. Enter into our hearts, I pray, and forgive us of our sins. Hasten the footsteps of those who are coming. And Lord, we ask that our minds will be focused on you. So even if we have to put away our cell phones, put away all the other literatures that we may be reading, remove from a particular seat because someone will talk and distract us and take us away from that blessing. Lord, whatever it takes, I ask that you will do it unto us now so that at the end we will receive your blessings. These mercies I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, the privilege is given to me to, I know that we have many visitors in our midst, particularly this is, more, for most of us, it's uh, graduation weekend and uh, memorial weekend. So I will take this opportunity to uh, welcome our friends and our visitors. And in the meantime, I would ask for all the elders and ushers to assume positions so that you can actually extend a uh, warm welcome to those who are visiting with us. For our visitors, I hasten to let you know that we are at Conyers, a growing bunch of God-loving people, and we're always eager to welcome those who are visiting with us. So visitors, I need for you to listen very carefully as I go down the list of maybe categories of those who will be visiting with us today. So while I call different categories, if you believe that you fit appropriately into one of these, I'm going to ask you to stand and remain standing. So my first category is you're visiting or spending time with family and friends. Please stand and remain standing. Members, I need for you to be busy now moving around and extending a warm hand of welcome and fellowship. You're visiting with relatives and friends. Anyone here, you're here because you're doing business in town. That's in Conyers or Covington. Please stand. The next category, you have heard about our worship experience here at Conyers and you're very much curious in wanting to experience it for yourself. Please stand. The next category is, you are on the lookout for a new church family. Please stand. I need us to mark this face right here. He's on the lookout for a new church family. Please stand and remain standing. And last but not least, there is always a category that we may overlook. But it says, you were really, really dragged here this morning. Whether by a spouse, some in-laws, or even some friends. Please stand. Didn't want to be here, but anyway, you're here. Whatever the case may be, we are thankful that you have joined us today for worship. And we are positive 
that you have shown up today, not on your own, but as a divine appointment by God. And before I sit, I will quickly hasten to tell you two important things about Kanye's church. The first one is, we care about people. You may hear many say that the larger the church, the easier it is to just sit in the pews, take the identity of an unknown person who never interacts with others. Well, this is certainly not Kanye's. You will never be given the chance to be just called a number. Church for us is all about meeting with and getting to know and love God and his people. And secondly, we love God here in Conyers. We're just not some mere religious folks who enjoy meeting in a well-decorated building with a cross sitting on top of it. We come here because our hearts burn within us and we are passionate about his kingdom and his cause. We have answered the call today, including our visitors, to worship the creator of heaven and earth. So visitors, please join us along with the angelic host as we lift up and magnify the name of Jesus. Once again, welcome. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Thank you, sir. Our God is good. And every day, our God is good. We're in the house of the Lord, and as we prepare our hearts for worship, we will sing, Lord, prepare me to be that sanctuary that is pure and holy, that has been tried by the fire and proven to be true. trials are o'er. I am safe in the arms of God.
morning boys and girls. Uh, today's story, uh, my story is tailored around education because today is education day. So if you look at the screen over there, I have that beautiful structure up there. Who can tell me what that is? Anyone know what that is up there on the screen? New York Bridge. Anyone know the name of it? And we know it's in New York. Anyone know what's the name? Bridge Bridge. Oh, anyone? That's the Brooklyn Bridge. That's the Brooklyn Bridge. And I'm going to tell you a story about the Brooklyn Bridge. 
Okay, what is underneath the Brooklyn Bridge? Can you see what is underneath there? Water. And what happened is that, like in the 1800s, that bridge wasn't there. And one man, I'm going to call him John, he said, I think I can build a structure so that it connects Manhattan and Brooklyn together. And he got together, because now he said, and everyone, his colleagues, they said, that's impossible. You go on a wild chase that could never, ever happen. How are you going to build something to connect Manhattan and Brooklyn? And you cannot build a bridge like that. I don't care how good you are, you cannot build that. And he said, I think I could build it. So he went to another mathematician, mathematician and he went to a physicist, and he asked them, can you help me? to design the structure, that's foolishness. It can't happen. I won't waste my time to build that, to that. So guess what he had to do? He had to go to his son. And he said, I think the both of us can design a structure to connect Manhattan and Brooklyn together. So they did, and now when they had the structure, they went to whoever has the money, had the money, and the person said, okay, go ahead and build the structure. But while he was doing it in the first laying the foundation, the father died in, a, in an accident from the bridge. So he died, and before he died, he asked his son, can you please make sure my vision of a bridge to connect Manhattan and Brooklyn got completed? So the son said, Dad, that's going to be the longest bridge in the world and the tallest structure in the world. I don't think I could do that. That's too much work. That's too much for me. I'm just a little boy. I can't do that. I, you, you need other, another person to do that. He said, you could do it. Go ahead and build it. Anyway, while the son was reluctantly building it, he met in an accident on the bridge, and he became paralyzed. And so he said, what am I going to do? This is my father's vision, and how am I going to build this bridge? So he asked his wife. His wife said, I don't know math, all that calculation. I don't know how to do all of that. I can't do all of that. I can't. He said, I'll teach you. You can do it. So she reluctantly again, she said, okay, go ahead. So she was his eyes and ears while he lay there in the bed. All he could do is look through the window of his apartment and see the bridge erect erected. It took 13 years to build this bridge. About 50 people lost their lives to build this bridge. But it's right there. Look at it. Magnificent. And it connects Manhattan with Brooklyn. So he did it. Why am I telling you this story? This guy had a vision. He had a vision. So each one of you needs a vision. A vision is something that you want to do. Then he laid out a plan. He made a plan. So you guys could make a plan if you want to be a doctor, a computer science, whatever it is, whatever you want to do, you have to have a vision. You have to make a a plan. And then he was determined. Determination. You need determination. So whatever you want to do, you have to determine that you're going to do it. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Remember how many people are saying they can't do it? All the intelligent people, all of them, no, it cannot happen. There it is. It happened. So you have your plan. You have determination and persistence. You have to be persistent in everything that you do. You cannot stop. Don't care if you got an A or if you get an F and you do try it again and get an F. When I was in elementary school, they said, if at first you don't succeed, try, try, and try again. So that's the message I would like to leave with you. You have to have a vision. You have to have a plan. You have to be determined and you have to be persistent and never give up. 
because you can do it. And look at that today. Beautiful structure because someone had a vision. Who wants to pray for us today? You want to pray for us? Anyone? Okay. Close your eyes. Bow your heads and close your eyes. You're praying. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for people to be saved. Thank you for moms and dads. Thank you for, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus to making us safe. Thank you for Jesus to help us be Amen. safe. Amen. You may go back to your seat. Join us as we sing of God's goodness and his grace in this song that says, How Great is Our God. Has God been good to anyone this week? Amen. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me how great. Our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age He stands, and time is in His hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God had three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. Stand for a call to worship. Yeah. 
a great teacher, the greatest invention, the greatest in inventor that ever lived. Your majesty reigns throughout this universe. And Lord, as we come today to talk about how you've blessed the minds of the members of this church, how you've given them gifts and talents, how you've blessed them with success, we pray that, Lord, today as we do this, that all the praise, all the glory, all the adoration will be pointed upward to you. That whatever we achieve in this life, we know it's due to your blessings in our lives. So, dear Lord, we pray that this service will glorify you as we thank you for the things we've accomplished, the things we're going to accomplish. We thank you for that. And we praise you on this holy Sabbath day that we may turn towards you and give you all the thanks, give you all the praises that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. The scripture reading this morning is taken from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 19 through 23. And it reads, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in the earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Verse 23 and last. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled, and not be moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under the heavens, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Here endeth the reading of God's holy words. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Sabbath Church. Happy Sabbath. To God be the glory. Three, four, one.
Good morning, church. Today is Education Day. And when students have graduated from high school, that's a great accomplishment. And we would like to honor those students today. I present to you at this time our graduates of 2019. Our first graduate is Miss Gabrielle McDonald. Gabrielle is our only kindergartner. Her church participation is Conyers King's Kids and Adventurers. Miss Gabrielle McDonald. Amen. Our next graduates are from the elementary school. Our first one is Mr. Michael Davis. He's graduating from fifth grade at Boxdale Elementary. He's attending Davis Middle School in July. He's in the Children's King's Kids, the Children's Bell Choir. He's a Pathfinder friend. His favorite verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. Michael Davis. Our next graduate is Ms. Haley Trumbor. Ms. Haley is graduating from fifth grade. Her favorite scripture is Psalms 139 and 18. She participates in the King's Kids. She's an usher at church and she's also a pathfinder. Ms. Haley Trumbor. Our next group is our middle school. Our first graduate is Miss Kennedy Booth. She's graduating from eighth grade. Her favorite verse is Romans 8:39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ our Lord. She's a pathfinder. She's on the youth choir, vacation Bible school, and bell choir. Miss Kennedy Booth. Our next graduate is Miss Lainey Brown. She graduated from the eighth grade from Deja. Oh, sorry, from Lithonia. Her favorite verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. She's in the youth choir. She's an usher and for VBS. She's attending GAAA in the fall. Miss Lainey Brown. Our next graduate is Tanika Chavalier. She has graduated from the eighth grade. That is Tanika. She's on the uh, children, the youth choir, and she participates as an usher. Tanika Chavalier. Our next graduate is Sue Ann McDermott. Sue Ann has graduated from Memorial Middle School, and she will be attending Salem High School in the fall. Sue Ann is Pathfinder, and she's also in the Conyers Youth Choir, Sue Ann McDermott. We have our high school next. Our first graduate is Mr. Dylan Augustine. He graduated from Rockdale High School. His favorite verse is Proverbs 24 and 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. Church participation is youth choir, communication department, and former Pathfinder. He will be attending Georgia State University to pursue a film career. Dylan Augustine. Our next high school graduate is Mr. Kendall Belfon. Kendall's favorite Bible verse is Psalms 1-1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. He is a junior deacon. He assisted the junior Pathfinder counselor. He's in the youth choir, our base. And he will be attending Georgia State University in the fall for pre-nursing. Kendall Ben Belfon. Our next graduate is Miss Kaylee Booth. Kaylee graduated 
from Salem High School, Rockdale Magnet. Sorry, Rockdale Magnet. She will be attending Augusta University in the fall, studying molecular biology. Her favorite verse is Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye come upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. She's in VBS. She's a Pathfinder, a youth choir, and AY Council. It's Kaylee Booth. Amen. Our next graduate is Corey Curtis. Corey has graduated from Heritage High School. She will be attending Georgia Southern University in the fall, studying graphic design with animation and business. Her favorite verse is Psalms 3, 3 through 8. She's a former King's Kid and a former youth choir member, Corey Curtis. Our next graduate is Faith Glasgow. Um, Faith is graduating from the 12th grade, and that is for Faith Glasgow. Our next graduate is Tara Jean-Louis. Tara graduated from Salem High School. She will be attending Clayton State University in the fall, majors, majoring in dentistry. Her favorite Bible verse is Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. The church participation is Legacy Bell Choir, uh, youth choir member, assistant director, junior counselor, drill instructor for the Pathfinder Club, a communications team member, and an usher. Tara Jean-Louis. Amen. Our next graduate is Ms. Rihanna Sterling. Rihanna has graduated from Rockdale Magnet School. Um, she will be attending Georgia State in the fall, majoring in biology, pre-med. Her favorite scripture is Proverbs 31 and 30. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. She is a former Pathfinder. She was a former King's Kids member, youth bell choir member, youth choir member, Believe member, usher, and a Vacation Bible School volunteer. Ms. Rihanna Sterling. Our next graduate is Jonathan Vernon. Jonathan Vernon will be enlisted in the United States Marine Corps uh, coming in August. He's a graduate from Georgia Cyber Academy. His favorite verse is Psalms 34 and 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. He's a Pathfinder and a Youth Choir member, Mr. Jonathan Vernon. Our next graduate is Ms. Gianna McLeggan. Gianna will be attending Georgia State in the fall, majoring in music technology and music management as her minor, a double major, excuse me. Gianna McClellan. Amen. The next group is our college group. Okay. Uh, we have Cassandra Blaze. She's from Canada. She um, graduated with a degree in paralegal. Her favorite verses are Psalm 66, 19, and 20. And she's a relative of Tara Jean Louis and the Jean Louis family. So it's Cassandra Blaze. Our next graduate is Miss Michaela Davis. She's a graduate of Georgia State University, advanced honors. She will be attending Loma Linda in the fall to study medicine. At Georgia State, she was a volunteer coordinator for the Panther Food Recovery Network, a member of the Minority Association of Pre-Health Students, a member of the American Medical Students Association, member of IMPACT, member of the Tribeca Biological Honor Society, a member of the National Society of Collegiate Scholars, Ms. Michaela Davis. Amen. Our next college graduate is Mr. Larry Jacobs IV. He graduated from Stanford University with a degree in computer science, and he's still in California, so please pray for him. He will be graduating next month. So that's Larry Jacobs IV. Our next graduate is Mr. Rayvon Melendez. 
Rayvon's favorite verse is Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. He's an Army National Guardsman. He's a former Pathfinder, a deacon, a men's ministry leader, member, Mr. Rayvon Melendez. Rayvon will be teaching his majors in math, so kudos for all of our educators. Amen. Um, our graduate, our next graduate is Christoph Randall, graduated from Tuskegee University with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a minor in material science engineering. His favorite verse is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Christoph Randall. Our last graduate is Natalie Santelli. Um, she has graduated from college, and um, that's all the information I have on her. But Conyers Church, on behalf of Family Life and the Education Department, we'd like to um, introduce you to our 2019 class. Amen. Church, as you see these students, please congratulate them and wish them the best and because uh, education is, is difficult and to graduate is a major accomplishment. Thank you. I'm here to read the prayer request, and I want to add one to these that I have here is to pray for the students, to pray for those of us who are graduating and those of us who, um, are, who have graduated or will be graduating later this year. All right. So there are many prayer requests here today. Uh, first one, pray for my grandmother, who is about to turn 82 on Monday. She is visiting us for the first time, and we love her, from Brandy, Jessica, and Justin. Please pray for Desiree. Her father has passed and pray for her family. Please pray for Sister Cook's father who suffered a stroke. Please pray for our families and our children. Pray for my daughter, Shawnee, for, for traveling mercies when she returns home. Pray for healing for Rachel, Everett, Charlene, Wise, and Tanya Coleman. Please pray that my children and grandchildren will allow God to work in their lives. Pray also that um, my medical tests come out well. Praise the Lord for all his blessings. Thank God for another day. Please pray for my nephew who is having mental health issues. Also pray for my health and my family. Please continue to pray for Sister Olivia's brother, Mark. Please pray for a family member who had to travel from St. Thomas in the, US, uh, in the US Virgin Islands for emergency medical treatment. Uh, this person is asking for prayer for, their, uh, for blessing in their family situation. Please pray for the bereaved families. Happy Sabbath, church uh, family. Please pray for my niece, Toya, who will be having uh, surgery on the 28th of this month at Emory. Um, I have asked God Almighty for a special prayer request. Uh, so please pray for me to get the answer from God Almighty. Praise God for Pastor Fox, who is celebrating a birthday this week. Espresso prayer for a job. Please pray for uh, my 94-year-old mom, Patricia Giles. She is declining. She's in the declining. She's in the declining stages of um, dementia. Kay Gordon. Please pray for our families. Uh, please pray for our family, whose son tried to commit suicide. There are many requests that we all have, whether they're spoken or unspoken. I'm, I have unspoken prayer requests, and I imagine you do as well. Um, there are some, could you have a show of hands of unspoken prayer requests? All right. 
Um, as you can see today, there is the bell choir set up, um, so there's not a lot of space, but if you would still like to, you can come and kneel here, come and draw close onto God. Sitting at his feet, sitting at his feet, that is where my life is complete. Sitting at his feet. For you today, we ask that you would first of all forgive us of our sins, that we may be heard by you, Lord. First, I want to thank you for your continued blessings in all of our lives, for bringing us here today on another Sabbath day, for keeping us in health and strength, for giving us traveling mercies and allowing us to come here, Lord, for all the blessings that you've given us throughout this past week. Lord, um, I also want to thank you for the students who have graduated, Lord. You brought them through many adversities, many trials, many projects and homework, Lord. Um, you brought them to the stage where they can celebrate their accomplishment. Lord, I also, now I want to ask you for all the prayer requests that, we, uh, that I just read. Lord, you know their situations. You know that many people are asking for healing, for guidance, for comfort in their times of need, Lord. We want to ask that you would be in their lives, that you would guide them, continue to comfort them, and care for them, Lord. I want to ask for the students, Lord, that you would guide them in their futures, whether they're going to college, whether they're going to high school, whether they're going on to post-secondary education, like graduate school or med school. Lord, please be with them, guide them, help them to use their education to further your purpose in this world, and that they will be able to use their education to sustain their own lives as well. just want to Thank you one last time for all your continued blessing in each of our lives, Lord, and for the, un, uh, for the unspoken prayer requests, Lord. You know all of their situations. Please be in the midst to bless, guide them, and give them comfort in all their situations. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. He's my deliverer, in him shall I trust. Praise the name of Jesus. Because of who you are, I give you 
glory because of who you are I give you praise because of who you are I will lift my voice and say Lord I worship you because of who you are, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Nisi, Lord you reign in victory, Jehovah Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you. Because of who Because of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you. Because of who Gabby, thank you very much. Joel, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I remembered when I was here just listening to this song, I remembered a situation where Jesus sent out his disciples two by two to go and preach and teach. And when they came back, they were there, you know, I don't want to say bragging, but they were happy. They were, they were elated and they were telling, Master, we, we cast out demons in your name and we did this and we did that. And the reception, the people, they accepted us. It was great. It was a great feeling. And Jesus Christ 
of course, gave them kudos. But then he said one thing. All that you have done, all the things that you've accomplished in my name, but just pray that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I remember when I was, the first time I saw someone with, with a gown on and that, this big thing at the back, when I was much, much younger, I said, one day I want to wear one of those gowns, one of those things. And I know that young people, they're looking on. I know one day you too want to wear one of these, but it does not come so easy. You are, you are, uh, the graduates have, have listened to your, your biography, just so many great things, so many accomplishments. But there's one thing I want to say, though, that all that you've accomplished, remember Jesus Christ at all times. Just make sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. According to Proverbs 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And this includes teaching our children how to return a faithful tithe and offering. Uh, today, the offering that we'll be collecting today is for the Georgia Cumberland Ministries. And I'm going to ask you that you will continue to be faithful and true to Jesus Christ when it comes down to your tithe and offering. At this time, let us pray. Great God and our Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you for allowing us to be in your course today. We thank you for all the blessings you have showered in us. And Lord, we have, we are, we are hearts is prepared for all the good things, Lord, and that is why out of love in our hearts we're going to uh, return our tithe and offering. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to bless us, and as we give, that our hearts will understand that everything you are the one who deserves all the glory and praise. Continue to give us strength, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good afternoon again, church, and happy Sabbath. Again, welcome to our education day. Um, this is the part of the program we, when we give um, recognition to our graduates. And I also want to know, if, are there any graduates here um, that graduated that did not participate in our program today? If you could just stand if you're here. Okay. Well, amen. Thank you. Elder Byers and young lady here, young man, young man, thank you for coming and um, congratulations on your achievements. Okay. okay, all right graduates, we have a little something for you from um, Family Life and from the Education Department. So if you could just come up, our first row here, so we'll start with Gabby. Thank you. Okay. 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 Haley. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Laney. Thank you. Dylan. Kaylee? Oh, sorry, Damon. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we'll start here with Corey. Oh, everybody stand up. Thank you, Corey. Okay, Kendall. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Kennedy and Michael. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Second here. Okay. Jonathan. Thank you. And Michaela. And our last row is Stephanie. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Denise. Thank you. Rihanna. Christoph. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have our GED teachers? Oh, and Tara. Would you all please come up? Okay. On behalf of the Education Department and Family Life, we'd like to thank you for your dedication to the GED program. Continued support, amen. Thank you so much. Okay. Is Elder Anderson still in the sanctuary? Okay. We have something for you too. Okay. And Pastor, on behalf of Education Department and Family Life, we'd like to give you a little something as well. So thank you so much for your service and dedication to our students and our family. Amen. Thank you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good 
gowns are just uh, evidence of what you went through to get where you are today. You did, a lot of, you did a lot of hard work. You put in late night studying. I hope you did. You, I hope it learned, it taught you how to pray better and harder before a test. And uh, your, your learning will continue, whether you're getting graduated from kindergarten whether you have your PhD, doesn't matter. You're going to learn your whole life. And we're here today to talk about learning that can transform your life. Learning can transform your life. Education is very important. Um, I, I, I see people that are educated that are void in their knowledge of uh, the things of the world. And I see people that are the world will consider uneducated, who are the most profound people I ever met. I know the story about a young man, his dad was a rice farmer in the Philippines, and he, his dad was sending his son to school by raising rice and selling 
the, pro, the livestock, and anything he could do to have his son go to university because he wanted his son to have a better life. I bet there's some witnesses in this auditorium today about parents who have sacrificed to get you where you're at. And we, and we thank you for your sacrificed parents. But as, as he did this, one day his dad came to the university driving an ox cart, because that's all he could afford to drive, because he had sold everything else so his son could go to university. And when he got there, his son saw him driving down the main road of the campus in his ox cart. He ran and hid so nobody would know his parent was a farmer, a poor farmer. And it crushed his dad. So as you're sitting here today, I want you to, I want you to reflect in your minds that you didn't get here by yourself. Those parents that made you do your homework, brothers and sisters that pushed you along, teachers that guided you and challenged you, um, also the God, the God above who blessed you with the mind and intelligence to accomplish what you've accomplished so far. But you're not done yet. And let's pray as we open God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for all you do for us. We give you the glory today. We thank you for showing your power in the lives of these individuals before us today. Thank you for the parents. Thank you for the family members, the friends, the teachers, the educators, the administrative staff, the pastors, the people that have been encouraging to these young people as they begin the next step in their education that you put before them. We pray that something said here today will be a blessing to them and their walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think one of the most important things about education is to realize where you're at in your life. An educated person doesn't realize how much they know the more you get educated, the more you realize how much you don't know. And you always got to keep learning. I mean, having grown up in a housing project and, and barely made it through high school and left home early at 17 and finished several of my degrees going to school at night while I was raising children with my wife. Uh, we got married early. That's why I'm still young. And we, um, and, and having to leave my work sometimes at night, uh, in the afternoons when I still should have been working and coming home and tutor my kids and, and helping them and learning myself and going back and working sometimes all night was to be there with my kids as they were accomplishing their steps in education. I can tell you that it, it takes a lot to become educated. And I think when we reflect back, these things you've accomplished, uh, education is something you're going to take to heaven with you. So you have to make sure you're getting the right type of education. Amen? You, know, you want to know that, you want to remember that God has given you gifts and talents, and sometimes I think that we, we forget where our success is really coming from. We, we, we look and we think that you know what, look what I have accomplished. And you have. Look what I have done, and I, you know, I'm number one in this class, or I've got the highest grade, but I think like the Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel, when you realize there's a God in heaven who does all these things, your life becomes different, and your life becomes better. So realizing where you're at in your life can be the biggest benefit of an education. I know when I, I know my place in certain areas. I know when I, how many of you sit at the same place at your tables each night when you come home? When you sit at the dinner table? Anybody still eat dinner together? Amen. And do you, do you have your own chair? Yeah, you sure you do. I remember coming home one night and uh, my, my wife was in my chair. And I felt so out of place because uh, I'd been sitting there for years, every night. And she looked like nothing was going on. And I felt on, the whole meal 
I felt uncomfortable because she was in my place. Amen? And I, and I was thinking about, man, but she said it didn't matter, but it mattered to me when I, because she didn't tell me what she had in mind. I, um, I remember the chair I sat in in third grade. Can you remember back, I don't know if they still do it so much or not, but remember when you were younger, maybe, or a little, you will make this memory later, remember when you went to school and there was chairs, circle, reading circles, you had groups like blue birds, red birds, yellow birds, you know, and it, it was based on your ability to read. Remember that? Yes or no? Because, you know, the blue birds were maybe the kids I remember that could read extremely well. Uh, they were way beyond the other first, second graders. And then the red birds, they were, they were at average on par with, every, with, with where they should have been. Then there were the cardinals. And the cardinals were a little slower. And uh, everyone knew why they were, they tried to make them, give them names, but everyone knew why they were in a certain group, right, man? They knew they belonged there because they were, they were with the group they belonged in at that time. I remember these chairs. I remember a little later in school, you know, when the, the teacher had his chair she had in the hallway. And it was for, it was for kids that couldn't behave themselves enough to be in the classroom. I know many people here remember that chair. <laughs> and uh, just a rumor that I, could, I don't remember it that vividly, but I, you know, if you would do something like, if you would pour water on Angie Scott's head when she walked out the recess and you dipped water in a cup from the aquarium in the classroom and poured it down on her from the window and got her soaking wet, you could end up in a chair, hypothetically. Um, if you, if you, if you push somebody on the playground, if you, if you put gum in somebody's pigtails that's set in front of you, you could, you could wrongly or rightly be convicted and have to be in that chair. Are you with me, yes or no? So that was a chair that, that you belonged in until you could get back into your regular chair. And I remember other chairs, you know, when you play sports, uh, the football team, all the d offensive guys sit together, the defensive guys sit together, and the best players were set near the coach, the quarterback was always beside the coach when the defense was on, and then the guys that hardly ever played or never played, they were way at the end of the bench, their place was down there because they hardly ever got their name called, but they had a place anyway. Today I want to talk to you about three conditions or three chairs that you as graduates are going to uh, be in, hopefully one of the chairs in your life. Chair number one is a chair of commitment. I actually brought some school chairs up here. Wooden chairs so that, I figure the, the school chairs, with us having a new school would be appropriate, amen? So, sometime in your life you're going to set in a chair of commitment. And if you're not careful, sometime in your life you're going to set in a chair of compromise. What is it? Compromise. And if you're not careful about that, sometime in your life you're going to set in a chair of conflict. And this all relates to your education and your walk with God. I, I know that many people think that as they grow, they automatically are going to get closer to God, but it's not true. Just like you study for tests, if you want to remain close to God, you have to do things to do that. Are you with me? So we have commitment, we have compromise, we have conflict. And today, graduates, I want to ask you, parents, I want to ask you, church members, I want to ask you, which chair, by the end of this sermon, do you see yourself in, and should you remain there in that chair? Because if you look at the Word of God, most Americans that go to church are not in the chair of commitment. And there's this downward trend, that's why I made the biggest chair Commitment, but as you, as you progress away from commitment to God, it gets smaller and smaller because it's a decline 
away from what God has given you. We ask ourselves, why is, why is it so easy? Why, why do we lose so many of our young people to the world? And this is the reason why. Because it is so easy to slip from commitment, to compromise, to conflict with God, unless you, unless you thrive to be in that committed relationship with God. And many, many institutions are the same way. I, I graduated from Emory University, one of the universities I graduated from. And Emory was started because of a guy named Chandler. Chandler. He was a bishop, and he, he, wanted, he was tired of churches back in the 1800s becoming so secular. So he, he happened to have some, a formula for something called Coca-Cola. So he, he, he put all the... Re, he sold this to a company who later became Coca-Cola, and he became very wealthy. But he put all that, that, that resource that he made from that into a place called now called Emory University. And it was made to be a school to bring people to God and fundamental beliefs of the Bible. Are you with me? Today you wouldn't recognize that if you go to Emory University. Because everything but God is taught at Emory University. I mean, they're intelligent people go there, and they've got a great medical school, but they don't talk much about God. And they, they usually talk about God in the terms of, of it really doesn't matter what you believe. Everyone's going to go to heaven. And we know the Bible says that's not true. So an institution can start in, with commitment and end up in conflict with God. Are you with me, church, yes or no? The Seventh-day Adventist church was started by people who were committed to God. Started by Methodists and, and Christian Connection and, and uh, Presbyterians and many, many different denominations came to get, young people from different denominations came together because they had a common belief that Jesus was coming back and they had a belief that the Bible truly is the Word of God. And they, were, and they weren't moved by church services and churches who were in, at that time, they saw them as compromising churches or churches even in conflict with God's Word. So they studied the Bible and they raised up by the miracle of God and by the miracle of the Holy Spirit, they raised up a denomination that, that, that is changing the world. And around the world, I would say the Seventh-day Adventist church is in chair number one. But there's parts of the world where they might be in chair number two, or maybe even chair number three. Because it's very easy to slide from commitment to God's word the compromise where you try to reach everyone else, but you don't try to reach them with God's word. You try to be like them to make people comfortable. Where God is a God who takes people where they are and takes them to where they need to be. And if you're not careful, you can end up with a, with a church in conflict with God. Where God, where talking about God can become, become unpopular. And uncomfortable. And the same thing happens in families. Are you with me? Because if you are sitting here today and you evaluate your mother and father, and I'm telling you mothers and fathers, your kids are evaluating you. If you're sitting here today and your kids are thinking, ah, my dad and my mom are sitting in the chair of commitment to God. I see them, they're, they're totally committed to their God, their church. They, 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 they do those things. I see those things. You know, I see them returning their tithe. I see them praying. I see them, I see them committed to the church and its growth. I see them always talking positive about what God is doing in our lives and always praying with me, you know. I, I see my parents in chair number one. Let me tell you something. If you're, if you're a parent of a young person, 
chances are, if you're, if you're committed, if you're in chair number one, chances are there's a good chance your child is going to end up in chair number two. Because the natural trend is for each generation to move away from God and not to stay with God. We're going to talk about that today. I want to show you in the Bible what I'm talking about with the church. Go with me to the book of Ephesians. What is it? Ephesians chapter 1. Go there with me. Ephesians chapter 1. And we want to find out the truth so we can change our future. How about it? Amen? Do you want to change the future to where God, what God wants done and not what Satan's trying to do to your family? Do you want that? Yes or no? Do you? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. My Bible says, now listen to this. Ephesians is a church of love. Let me give you an example here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this re- are you there? For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all saints. Your what? Your love for all saints. Now, now, Paul goes through Ephesians talking about their love 19 times in six chapters, but you know, this gives examples here. Ephesians 1, 4. According, according as he has chosen us, in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in what? Love. Okay, a church of love. Are you with me, yes or no? Verse 15, Ephesians 1, 15. We just read it, okay? And verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 4. But God who is richly in his rich mercy for his great love, with his great what? Wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in, in sins has quickened us together with Christ. By the grace, by grace you are saved. Verse, chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in what? Love. Verse 18 in chapter 3, may, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and height and uh, length and height or, and depth and height, and to know the what? The love of Christ which patheth knowledge that ye might going on. Chapter 4, verse 2, with all the lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Chapter 4, but speaking the truth in what? Love. Going on. Verse 16 in chapter 4, okay, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted that, that by, by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual work working in the measure of every part and maketh increase a body unto the edifying of itself in what? All the body works together. God's church works together. Amen? But we do it because we have the love of God. We can work together. We can be a living organism for God. Chapter 5, verse 2, and, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and has himself and given himself as an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your who? Wives, as Christ loved the church. Chapter 5, verse 28. So ought men to love their what? Their wives. As their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Verse 33 in chapter 5. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Chapter 6, verse 23, peace to the, be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, grace be with you, grace be with all them that love their, of our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Now watch. This is a church of love. Amen? A church of love, filled with love. Go with me to Revelation. Let's see how this church is progressing as time goes by several years later. Let's go to Revelation in chapter 2. Chapter 2 of the book of Reve- Revelation. Is that in the back of the Bible or the front? Okay, good. Back of the Bible? All the way to the back, right? Yeah, cha- back of the Bible. You, since you, have, you may not have been there for a while. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. Okay. Now we have a church that used to be known as a church of love by Paul. Now, we, now we're in Revelation, and God is looking at these seven churches, and let's see what he says. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, the same church, 
Right, these things which he withholdeth the seven stars of his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, thy labors, and thy patience, and how thou, castest, thou canst not bear them that are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. What, what is it that he has against this church? Because thou has done what? The church of love has left its first love. So the church that was in chair number one has moved to chair number two. Are you with me, church, yes or no? They have moved from the one thing that, that set them apart, the love of God, and now they have moved, they have, they have digressed to being a compromising church. What, happened, what happens to a church that's in that position in chair number two? They begin to have a false sense of security. They begin to look at themselves like they're more than what they are. They begin to think it's all about them and not about God. They begin to have programs that point to themselves and not to God. Are you with me, church? Yes or no? They, they, become, they become calloused to how they treat God. Because it's all about their success. It's all about what they can do. And they begin to look inward instead of upward. And we have a famous church that's in compromise. We know what it is. The church of Laodicea in, in, chapter, in chapter 3, verse 14. If you want to turn there. And this, and this is a sister in compromise of this Ephesus church. Revelation 3, 14. And, the, and to the angel and to the church of Laodiceans write, These are the things which the amen and the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God, a church in compromise. I know that works. Thou art neither cold or hot. I would, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art what? Lukewarm. And neither cold nor hot, I will spew or spit thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased in my, and with goods, and need of nothing. And knoweth not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. You see, when a church sets in a, in a position of commitment, they know God is everything to them. They know that everything they do and accomplish in life is because their Creator has blessed them and endowed them. Amen? But when a church moves away from that, they become self-aware and not God-aware. And they become different. They go from being spiritual alive to being spiritual anemic. They go from being convictional to being compromising. Well, it doesn't really matter that much what we do on Sabbath. They, call, they, go to, they go from being on fire, their bones are hot for God, to being AWOL from God. And you'll know that word if you joined the Marine Corps recently. Pretty sick. They live for today. When, when, you, when you're a church that's, in, that's committed to God, you live for what God is doing in your life today. And when you're a church that's in compromise to God, then you talk about what you did before because you're not doing nothing today for God. So you're always talking about back then. I'm telling you, what, Christianity is dynamic. It's moving forward, so you're always looking forward because it, what you did back there is in the past, but what you're going to do now and tomorrow is where God is taking you. So your perspective is different. In, ch in chair number one, you're committed. You're hot for Jesus. In chair number two, you're lukewarm. In chair number three, you're empty. You're empty inside. You're not even sure that you even want to know God. And I've known people that went from here to there within a matter of a year. I have no ministers. They were on fire for God. 
and now are just on fire because of their anger. Their fire is against God. So my question today in the Conyers Seventh-day Adventist Church is, where are we at today as a church? Most churches were born here but end up somewhere else. But I, I say we ought to be in chair number one. We ought to be, because chair number one, we're, we're committed to evangelism. If a, if a, church, is, if a church is committed to God, then, then they know God's heart is to reach the world, amen? Whether, whether it's through meetings, whether it's through Bible studies, whether it's because you sacrifice your, your resources, your time, your efforts, and you start a school, and you go, up against, you go up against a county that says no, and you keep going up and going up and going up until they finally say okay. Because you are committed to reaching people for God, especially children. Amen? So that's why Education Day this year takes on a different perspective for us, because we're moving forward in a new dimension for God this year. Because we're committed to do what God wants us to do. You know, and, and in, fa in families... I see it in the Bible. I just didn't make that up about if your dad's in chair number one, you're probably going to be in chair number two. And, this, and graduates, listen to this. You don't want to end up in chair number two. I see it in families. David had a son named Solomon. And, he had, and, so, and then he had a grandson named Rehoboam. Who became, they both became kings. David was committed to God. Remember Psalms 42, David says, as a, as, a, as a deer panteth for the water brook, so my heart panteth after thee, my God. Amen? David's heart was toward God. He thirsted for God. He made mistakes. Oh, yeah. We, we, can, we can count them all. But David's heart, love, in his heart, he loved God supremely. Amen? And when he did something wrong, he was correctable. He didn't try to hide it. Oh, he did. But then when, he, when it came out, he admitted to it, and he asked God to forgive him, and he became, in a way, even closer to God. He paid for his mistakes. David sat in a chair of commitment. David knew God. David walked with God. David talked with God. Last week, we heard about David and Goliath. God even raised, raised up a young boy that could defeat a giant. David, David life reminds me of somebody who just baptized. When you first come into the church, you know, when you, when you study the Bible, you know that God can do anything, amen? Young people, when you go to Sabbath school, and you're sitting in the, when you're sitting in the Sabbath school, and you learn those stories in the Old Testament, and, some of the, and then in the New Testament, about the, the Apostle Paul, and how he, was, how he was fearless for God, and shipwrecked, and bit by snakes, and all those crazy things, and he's and singing in prison. And you say, I want to be like that. When I grow up, I want to be a missionary. I want to do something that matters, that will go to heaven with me. And then, and you, I remember when I first came into the church, I I was a brand, you know, I, I didn't go to church as a kid. And I had to buy those tabs to put on the side of my Bible because I couldn't find the books. And I remember they'd say, okay, we're, the pastor would be up front. Turn to the book of Jeremiah. I, I, I didn't know where Jeremiah was, but I knew he was in there somewhere. And I'd be looking in the front, and, you know, they, I'd get there about the time they were leaving there. But I know when I got there, God was going to share something with me. Amen. I was on fire. I'm, I might have not known everything that I, that I needed to know, but I knew enough about God to know that His Word, in His Word, is treasure. And He had a word for me. And David was a man after God's own heart, and he sat in a chair of commitment to God. Then he had a boy named Solomon. The high hopes of this guy. The wild, a man of wisdom. Solomon did not sit here. Solomon sat in compromise. Let me, young people, I want you to count the personal pronouns in these verses I'm going to read to you. I'm, in Ecclesi I'm turning to Ecclesiastes. And let's see what Solomon says about who's important to him. Are you with me? 
Count the personal pronouns as I go through them right here real quick. Okay? Ecclesiastes, let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. Let's see where Solomon's heart was. See, when you go to, when you go to compromise, you start looking at yourself like you're everything. So let's see where, where Solomon's attitude was really pointed toward. Are you with me, yes or no? So count these in your head, or you can put your fingers up. You may run out of fingers and toes, but let's look at this. In just a few chapters here, okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 1. And I said, I said in mine heart. How many pro personal pronouns? That's two, right? I am mine. Okay, my heart. I won't. Go to now. I will, I will prove thee with, my, with, with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. And behold, this, this is also vanity. I said of laughter. It is mad and of mirth. What, is, what do with it? I sought in mine, mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart, my own mine heart, with wisdom, and to lay hold of the, on folly till I might see what is good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven and all the days of their life. I made me great works. I builded houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them and all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I, I, I got me servants and maidens and, and had servants born in my house. And I also had great possessions and, and of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me all the, also silver and gold and particular treasure of kings of, 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 of provinces. Of the province. I got me men, singers and women singers, and delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great. It increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and, all, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity. Vexation of spirit. And there was no prophet under the sun. How many personal pronouns? Anybody count them? Yeah, I counted 46. In just 11 verses. I, I, I. You see, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you're committed to God, you put God first. And then, and then if you're not careful, the world will tell you it's you that's doing these things. And before you know it, you're worshiping yourself, you're giving yourself everything. And you're not giving God anything. When you're committed to God, your priority is to worship God. When you're compromising, your priority is to feel good. When you're committed to God, you can't wait to come to church. You can't wait to get here to praise your God and to thank Him for what He's doing in your life. You can't, you know, I know God that I wouldn't have got that A on that test. I know that, that everyone else in the class missed number 17, that, that, that multiple choice question. But, but God, I got it right. And I didn't even, I wasn't sure, but you told me, you showed me to write that, that answer down there. when you're committed to God, but when, you, when you're compromising, you just say, oh, man, I'm good. These other students are dull compared to me. I worked harder. I deserve it. And we can mess ourselves up. And then, if you have a, a dad who's in, who's in a, a position of compromise, guess where his son is probably, or his daughter is probably going to end up? In conflict. And it's true. Go with me to 1 Kings. We're, we're getting done. 1 Kings. Are you with me so far? You, you see how the slide is downward away from the truth, downward away from commitment to God? It's a natural way the world goes. 1 Kings chapter 12. 
1 Kings chapter 12? Were you there? Say amen. And now we have King Rehoboam. And he's, he's starting his reign. And, and, and I'm telling you what, when, you're in, when your dad is in compromise, you know, everything was about Solomon. Solomon, his pleasure, his women, his, his everything. And I did it all. He never talked about all the people that were sacrificing for him to be able to do this. And, 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 and taxation was supposed to be the highest it's ever been during that time frame. And, and so the people came to Rehoboam and said, can you cut back on the taxes? And let's see what happens here. Verse 4. Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and this heavy yoke which he put us in, put on us, and we will serve you. So he said to them, depart from, from, the, depart from three, for three days and come back to me. And the people departed. And then King Rehoboam counseled, consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he said, how do you advise me to answer these people? Let's just flip the page if you have to. Go back down to verse 16. And listen to this. Now, when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, he did what? It's not about them, it's about me. The people answered the king, saying, What share have, have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see, your own, now see to your own house, O David. So Israel departed to their tents. But Rehoboam resigned over, reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt, in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue, but all Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore King Rehoboam mounted his chariots in haste to flee to Jerusalem. You see what happens when, you're, when, you, when, you, when you live around people that are in compromise. You think that's the way to do things. So you end up being here because the slide is naturally down and you actually destroyed what God has set up. It happens in churches. When you have people that care more about their own selves than they care about the will of God in God's church. Are you with me, church? So you... Rehoboam heard stories about how Grandpa was a man of God. Grandpa slew lions and bears and Goliath and, and, and led armies. And he talked with God, and he walked with God. But then Dad seemed to think about himself a lot. And serving, and bringing women into his life to serve Baal. And so he ended up in the decline down to, con to a, a place where he was, he was conflicted with God and everyone around him. This, let me tell you something. The lesson here is talk is cheap. You hear what I'm saying? If you're a dad, if you're a mom, and you're telling your kids, I want you to be close to God. I want you to, I want you to have a committed relationship with God. Are you listening to me? I want you to be all about God, but you're not that way. But you're talk, you talk that way. You're talk. And your actions don't go to, they don't jive. Your kids are reading you better than you can read yourself. And when you, when you say, God's number one in my life, don't you see me on Sabbath? Your kids are saying, yeah, but I see you the other six days in a week too. I see you, I never see you praying with us. As a family, mom may get us in a, at the family order, but you're never there. I never see you ask God to bless us when we go on a trip in the car. I, 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 I know that when you get paid, do you, rarely do you ever give anything back to God and say, thank you, God. You see, your kids are watching us. And if you say you're sitting in chair number one, but you're really in chair number two, the kids know it. So where do you expect them to end up? The normal progression is downward. And if we're moving downward ourselves, it just, it just makes our kids that much, 
more likely to end up where we don't want them to be. Our lives are an example to our kids. Talk is cheap. God help us, amen? If you're a parent in chair number two, and these are your kids out here before us, I hope by the end of the service today that you'll move back to a committed relationship with God. Because you can go back. We're Bible. I mean, whole, whole, whole religious systems are like this. Go, go with me to, go with me to Josh, or Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Go to front of your Bibles. Go past Joshua. Go to the little book of Judges. Not that little. It's kind of little. Judges chapter 2. When you're there, say amen. Are you in Judges chapter 2? Amen. See, I'm still slow. In verse 6. You see, Joshua was somebody who sat in chair number one. Amen? Yes. Committed to God. On fire for God. And, and when Joshua, chapter, chapter 2, verse 6, and when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. Now listen to this. And the people served who? How long? All the days of Joshua. You see the influence we have? All the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. Now let me tell you something, people. Parents, grandparents, we're going to die probably before our kids if Jesus doesn't come back soon. Are you with me? And if you want your influence to make sure, to help your kids get to heaven, it better be the right influence. And Joshua and the children of Israel, Joshua sat in chair number one. He knew the Lord. He knew him. And he knew the works of the Lord. And as long as the people lived, they followed the Lord. And chair number two was the elders. They outlived Joshua. And they followed Joshua. They followed after Joshua. And they knew the Lord. They knew, they knew about the Lord. And they knew his works. But they were in chair number two. They, were, they weren't on the same relationship with God that Joshua was. So the next generation after the elders, they heard about God, but they didn't believe any of the works were God's. Verse 10. And also all, the, all, all, also all that generation were gathered under their fathers. And there arose another generation after them. So we, we think, look at this generation coming up now. They're different. Yes. Which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did what? Evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, brought them out of slavery, and followed other gods. And the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. Chair number one, they knew the Lord, and they knew about the works of the Lord. Chair number two, they knew, they knew about God, they knew about his works. And chair number three, they didn't know about the Lord, they didn't know who he was, and they didn't care about his works. They were setting in conflict with God. So they're lost, is what we're saying here. So how do we apply this? If you know your parents, older brothers and sisters, if you know you're in chair number one, and you have a younger brother, younger sister, a son or daughter, they may naturally be sliding away from God. So you need to do everything you can to help them remain spiritually connected to God. Does that make sense? When you say that, when you say that I'm sitting in chair number one in my life, I'm in the chair of commitment, I, I want you to be there too, you've got, you got to show them with your life that you belong in chair number one, that you're committed to God. You've got to pray for your brothers, sisters, your younger, your siblings, your, your, your family members. You've got to pray for your kids. But they have to know you're praying for them. Just don't go in your prayer closet and hide it. No, 
I tell my kids, every, I'm praying for you. When my, when my son was, I, when my son was, who was in the Marines left the Lord, I mean, it's easy when you're in the military to lose your connection with God because it's, a, it's an institution made to kill things and destroy countries. That's what it is. So, so my son went in the Marines. I want him to be a pastor, so he became a Marine pilot. I don't know about that. And I prayed for him. Oh, Dad, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. And I knew where my commitment to God was. And I went to see him one day to help him move down to Pensacola after he got out of flight school. And I'm down there, and I, I'm helping him pack up, and I, I open his, his drawer and the bottom of his cabinet is filled with beer. I said, well, what's this? Oh, oh, uh, I just got that because my buddies come over, you know, and um, I don't drink it, but my buddies drink it, you know. And I said, oh, my, my, my. I said, how quick they fall. And he was, as a matter of fact, he, he had, he, my son got so upset because he was, do, he met a young man that was impressive. He was an Adventist, and this guy, this young man, was going to flight school with him. This young man had went to the Naval Academy all his whole life. He just wanted to be a pilot and fly Marine Corps aircraft. Are you with me? This, this, is guy's, this guy's dream. He graduated from Naval Academy. He's an engineer now. And, he, and he's in flight school. And, he, and he's Tim's best friend. And pretty soon, my other son came down who was in chair number one, who was committed to God. He was in medical school at Loma Linda. And he comes down and, and he stays with Tim for two weeks. He did a residency at Pensacola. And while he was there, he met this young man. And this young man admired my older son who was really connected to God. Are you with me, yes or no? So, he, so my son was eating vegetarian food and he didn't drink, he didn't do any of this stuff and, this guy, and, and he was giving Bible studies to Tim's friends and pretty soon this kid goes, uh, I want to learn more. So he goes, oh, you guys don't drink. Tim, why do you drink? You know? You, you guys don't eat this. Why, why do you eat that with us, Tim? I didn't know that. And pretty soon Tim is furious. Because he's found out. Are you with me? Because he, did, he wasn't a Daniel. He was a kneeler. He was kneeling down. And his brother came who was standing up. And this young man who had, all he wanted to be, all his life he wanted to be was a Marine Corps aviator to fly those aircraft, to bomb people and all that kind of stuff. All he wanted to do was that. He was convicted. He was convicted. That he shouldn't do it. So that Monday, after doing Bible studies, he walked into a colonel's office in his civilian clothes. He refused to put the uniform back on. He said, I'm, I can't be in an organization that kills people. He took off his uniform, and they, and they discharged him. A after he spent million, over a million dollars putting him through flight school, they let him get out. He even had an honorable discharge. They believed he was, he was convicted. They didn't hurt him. They could put him in prison for this. But he stood up anyway. And now he's a, now he's, he flies, he's a mission pilot. Trained by the United States Marine Corps. His wife's a nurse. Met her at Southern Adventist University. And it helped my son, who was falling away, come back to Jesus because he couldn't answer the questions. You see, we got to be aware of this as Seventh-day Adventists, that if, 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 we, if we start out here, even our whole church could end up here if we're not careful. We have to be vigilant for God. Amen? How to keep your child in chair number one. I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you four remedies. Parents, graduates, this is what you need to look for. An example. You need to be an example. If you're, if you're a graduate, you're going away to a secular college, or even one of our colleges, you need to know that you, people are watching you. People are watching you. Be an example. Let them know you're committed to God. Let your kids know it. Environment. Why, do we st why are we starting the school? Because we want our kids to have every opportunity to go to heaven. I couldn't afford to put my kids in, in our schools, but God could. 
And somehow, my wife and I were talking one day, and our kids were be, having, being influenced the wrong way. They were good. I mean, we, we were in the best school district in Florida at the time. Best school district in all of Florida. But my kids were learning about evil of this world. I mean, they were, they were off the charts as far as their academic success. But they were, were, they're, they're, what they were being influenced by wasn't worth the price. So we, we, put, we, we sacrificed. My wife said, if we need to eat peanut butter sandwiches every day, three times, I wasn't happy about this either. She goes, we'll eat it. We're going to put our kids where they need to be. So environment. Put your kids in the right environment. I mean, sell that big house, buy yourself an RV or trailer, but make sure your kids go in the right environment. Because my sons, my, my nephew, my, my sister who's passed away, her son came to live with us when he was in sixth grade because he was failing every subject in school. And she put him with us. And we had family worship every night. We disciplined our kids with love. And before long, he went from straight F's to straight A's in school. And he was going to camp. We sent him to our Christian camps, and he was singing that song, you know, in my father's house, there's many, many rooms. You know the song, there's, there's a big, big table. Remember, you know the song? And, uh, and in the backyard, the big backyard, we can play football, that stuff. You know, that's my best singing voice, okay? But uh, he was... He was changing for God. And his dad didn't like the fact that he wasn't there, so he came and got him. And four years later, he died of an overdose of drugs. You see, you can't put your kids in the wrong environment and expect them to turn out the right way. That's why we're opening this school, amen? We want our kids to have the opportunity, to every opportunity. I mean, the, the trend is away from God anyway. So we might as well do everything we can to keep our kids, Amen? Experience. I mean, every time my kid had an opp- my kids had an opportunity to go on mission trips, I took my kids door to door. They know how to do Bible studies. My kids, when my son, one son got married, on his honeymoon, he did a revelation seminar in my district. That's what him and his wife did. I mean, they did other things too, but they had a revelation seminar. Amen? <laughs> I mean, I mean just, just having a family altar, taking walks on Sabbath, talking about how God made this beautiful tree and how old this tree is and how this sea can produce this. Those things stick with your kids. Examination. Look at yourself. Look at yourself right now. And be honest. Where are you at? Are you where you need to be? Pastor, is it too late for me? It's not too late. Even if your kids are growing up, you can still help turn their lives around. You know, the best, the best proof that there is a God is a changed person. And when, when, when your kids see you, your life being changed by this God they hear about, it changes them. My, I worry about. I worry about kids that end up there. And I worry, I'm concerned about even the ones that are here because they can fly. But the ones I worry the most about are the ones that are being brought up in households with their family that are here. Because if you're here as a parent as a mentor, as an elder in the church, as a deacon or deaconess, if you're here, you are influencing people to be there. If, if, if we're leaders in the church and, 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 and people are looking up to us and, and they, don't, they only see us complaining about things or bringing up whatever's wrong, but we're never there to, to soothe, to comfort, to love, to help, to put out a helping hand, but, all we, but we're good at complaining. I, don't, I, will, I never understand how leaders can be part of the problem. Leaders should fix the problems. Leaders should be the ones that are on their knees praying, not, not, not on their phone criticizing, 
not talking about, I don't want to hear this service today, I'm going to go home and watch YouTube. That's not a leader in this church. That's somebody that's in compromise. They might act like they're committed. Being committed doesn't mean you walk around and be the holiest of holies. We already got somebody to do that. His name is God. Being committed means that you're in a relationship with Jesus as shows in your life. And when you walk down those vestibule in the morning or these hallways, you, you, the love of God shows in your walk with God. You don't come to church grumpy. You come to church expecting God to do something that day. Chair number one is the winner's chair. Chair number three is the loser's chair. And this is the gambler's chair. Because you're gambling, you can, you can act holy enough to trick people. I'm telling you, when, when conflict comes, it's going to come out who you really are. And when we have problems in a church, you know, instead of taking care of them and, and deal with them in a loving, Christ-like way, the people here, the first thing they want to do is throw people under the bus. Oh, the leaders. Oh, the music. Oh, this. How about helping those people get them back to here? And in the process, you'll get there too. Amen? How do you change the chair you're sitting in? If you're in chair number three, your life's in turmoil right now. You don't even want to be in church. You're squirming right now because you have to be in church. Maybe you came to, to support, and you don't want to be here. If you're in chair number two, you're, right now what you're doing is sitting there talking, this is about everybody else in this church but me. If you're in chair number one, you're, you're praying for everyone in this church, including yourself. Because you want, to, you want everyone to go to heaven. And you don't want your influence to hurt anyone. Are you with me, church? Open your Bible. And when you read your Bible, know that it's, those promises are for you and everybody around you. If you're, when, you when you study your Bible, don't, don't take it as some old version of a, a dinosaur council because I'm going to tell you what, when I read the Word of God in my life, my life changes. How about yours? God does things when you open His Word. The, the Ephesus church fell. And God said, it's okay. I'm going to bring you back. Do the things that got you there the first place. Amen? Remember, Revelation 2, verse 5, Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Amen? Realize where you're at with God, and get to where you need to be with God. Remember when you were in chair number one, when you were committed to God. Repent, and start doing the things that helped you be in that position with God. Start talking to God again. It's amazing how he answers you when you talk to him. Can I get a witness? God is saying, get up and move from where you are to where you need to be. I mean, move these chairs out of your life. And don't let them be a possibility because become so sold out to God that the only option for you is commitment to God. And when you do that, people around you are going to be influenced. Are you with me, church? He was the first mate of the HMS Bounty. Mutiny on the Bounty. You saw the movie, you read the book, yes or no? The old movie where Humphrey Bogart was... Captain Bly. Remember that? It's true. And the, and the hero is Fletcher Christian, that first mate. It's all true. But you know the rest of the story? Fletcher Christian was raised by a Christian family. Actually, nobility. And he was on his ship, and, and, be, and he, had fell on, he had fallen away from God because of the influence of a captain who was ungodly. And on that trip to get breadfruit from Tahiti and bring it back to feed the slaves back in, back, back in the lands held by the English, the, Brit, the English Empire, 
as he was doing that, he met this young Tahitian princess that he fell in love with. Uh, he couldn't pronounce her name, so he called her mainmast on the ship. That was his mainmast. And as they left there, the pirate, he had to leave his wife behind, but the, but the, but the captain was so mean to the people that they were planning a mutiny. So they convinced Fletcher Christian to be part of this mutiny. And he decided to do it. And nine of, nine of the crew, actually a few more of the crew, they had died, they died soon after, took, took over the bounty, cast the captain and some of his crew into the water. They, had, they made it back to England some way, thousands of miles away. And these royal sailors became pirates. In the 1700s, if you, were, if you, if you mutinied, it was, you, you were hung if you were caught. So they knew that the British Royal Navy was coming after them, so they, they went back to Tahiti, picked up their wives. Some of them had got married to these women while they were there picking up the breadfruit. And they, and they went, and they had some Tahitian men there too with them, and they went and they were looking for a place to hide. And they found this little island family that was in the middle of nowhere, wasn't even on the charts that he had. And, and they... And they Start decided they would stay there. So they burnt the ship. They were, they were going to stay there. It had water. It had, it had good soil. They had coconuts. They, they started to plant their crops, and they were going to live in utopia. Well, it was all good for the first year until they learned how to make wine. Then they started getting drunk, and there wasn't enough women for all the men. They started killing each other. And by the end of that year, there was only two men left. Fletcher Christian was dead. He had a couple kids by them to his wife. They were left behind. There were eight Tahitian women left. The Tahitian men were dead. All the, all the pirates were dead, except for two men. And one of them, the name was John Adams. And the other guy died of, of tuberculosis soon after that. So it was only John Adams left. And he was a rough, tough sailor who was down here in his life, in conflict with God. And now he had eight Tahitian women, a bunch, 28 kids running around the island, and he was the only man there. And he could have took advantage of those women. He could have done a lot of things. But instead of that, Fletcher Christian's wife gave him the Bible that was on the ship. And he started reading it. And he could barely read. And he made friends with some of the kids. And, they would, and he taught them how to read. They, they taught all their kids how to read from the Bible. In a few years, the Karen, the name of the island, became a living heaven. Fletcher Christian, I mean, uh, John Adams never took advantage of the other women. He had four children of his own. He was, he was a mentor to all the kids on the island. And when they finally rediscovered this island, the people, the people were biblical Christians because of this one man's influence. Are you hearing me, yes or no? Your, your influence will outlive you, good or bad. Because when they finally found this island, way off the coast of Australia down there, when they finally found this island, the people didn't eat pork. The people were keeping Sabbath. They didn't know what day Sabbath was, but they were keeping the whole day. And when the Adventists showed up there, almost the whole island converted to Adventism. And you know that there are more Bibles on that island than there are today. Even today, centuries later, we were talking about the 1700s. Centuries, hundreds of years later, the, the influence of one man named John Adams who read the Bible, who moved from chair number three over to chair number one, changed a whole society. You go there now, they have a, they have a jail, but nobody's ever in it. There's three Bibles for every human being on that island. The voice of prophecy broadcast there. It's their main form of entertainment is the voice of prophecy. And even the descendants of Fletcher Christian, even up to a few years ago, one of the descendants was the guy that ran the voice of prophecy broadcast on that island. You see what one person's influence can do. And as you graduate, as you move forward in your life, you're going to be going to universities or other schools. And you've got to, you're, going to make, you're going to make decisions now because if you make it then, it's going to be too late. You've got to make your decisions now who you're going to stand for. Because the natural, Satan's natural pull is away from God. It's an easy way to go. But you can be here. 
And you can be, and when Jesus comes, and when he calls you forth, you won't be by yourself. Because all those people that you influenced, when you stood up like Daniel, when you stood up like Esther, when you stood up for God's people, will be with you. Amen? He'll call you forth. Don't be by yourself. This education you're getting is not just to get a good job. Your education is to transform the world. And maybe today, in this place, maybe we need to remember where we need to be. Are you with me? I want to make a call today. If you're a parent, And you know that you need to move from where you're at, whether you're in compromise, conflict, and you need to move back to commitment to God. And you need special prayer. And today you're going to make that commitment. You're going to say, that's me. I want to be committed to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you're a parent, and if, and if you, and your kids know where you're at, I'm going to give you an opportunity to set the example today by standing as I pray for you. If you're that parent that says, I'm not where I need to be yet, but I'm committed today to move to where I need to be, with our heads bowed, I want you to stand up and show your man, woman, father, mother enough, student enough to stand up for God today. And admit that you have some shortcomings. But you are standing because you know that you need to be the example. Not only you, you need to confess to God today, he knows, but you need to confess to this world who you need to be. If that's you, stand for God. If you're a student, and if you, you've been in those places, in, in those classrooms where you have been pulled the wrong way, and sometimes you, you go the wrong way, and you feel yourself... You have success, but you want to have greater success in Jesus. You want your education not to be just for this world, but for, for eternity. Would you stand too? You say, That's me. I, I go forth, Pastor. I'm going forth into a new world, new, new discoveries, new opportunities, and I need to stand for God. I need to stand today and be committed to God. Please stand now. Father, <laughs> around this sanctuary today, we, we, we look at our families and we look at our kids and, and how, how tenuous this Christian walk can be. How one day we can be a church that the apostle can't say enough about how full of love they are next, a few chapters later. A few books later, they've lost it. And some of us in this place today are here to say, I might have slipped. I may have lost it, but I'm getting it back. Father, touch the people that are standing in a special way. When they go home today, let their witness be such that their kids will know that they're standing for God that there's something different. Let the, let the altar of the, house, of the homes of this church be open for business. Let the prayer circle be active and, and fervent. Bless these ones that are standing for you today. They're, no, they're doing nothing less than those three Hebrew boys that went in the fire. Because this world is a flaming place of evil today. You have people standing for you and say, not me. The fire I'm going to experience is in my bones for God. Bless your people. Bless the moms and dads, the brothers and sisters, the students, the graduates, the visitors today who are standing for you. Bless them in a mighty way. Teach them and lead them with your wisdom. And Father, may they be people like Joshua who knew God and knew about God's works. 
And may they teach others. Bless your church. Bless your sons and daughters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for a closing hymn if you're not standing already. Father, we, we know the general trend with gravity and with Satan is downward, but we need to go upward. And we ask you today to bless us, Lord, with staying power. That, Lord, when the, when the pools of this world, when, when churches are changing and becoming more like the clubs than they are the sanctuary in heaven, when, when the pool of the world is, is away from you and toward Satan and toward compromise. Lord, keep us committed for you. And bless these young people. Lord, I, we applaud their success, whether it's kindergarten or whether it's grad school. And their whole future is ahead of them. But Lord, as they're moving forward, marching forward, keep them on high ground. Father, don't let them be compromised. Let them be proud of their stand for you. Lord, give them strength to overcome. I, I ask you, Lord, today to set these graduates apart, to bless them, to protect them, to use them, to make them Daniels and Esthers 
in a world filled with people that are, that are kneeling to, this, to the altar of Satan. Make them different so that those who are looking for God may find their God, your God, through these witnesses for you. Bless them. We know we live in Babylon around us, but keep our eyes in heaven and keep our minds towards you. Bless your people. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sit down. I just want to welcome everyone. We, we welcome you at the end because there's usually no one to welcome at the beginning. <laughs> so we're glad you're here if you're watching online. We thank you for tuning in with us around the world. And we ask you today to keep your eyes and your hearts fixed on Jesus Christ. And we hope this is the place you choose to come and worship God each week. We have a couple announcements. One is from our, our secretary of our nominating committee. First, I want to thank Pastor Shias for that much-needed sermon, right on target. This is a ex very exciting list I'm about to read from our nominating committee, which is working hard, and it's the list for the school board for our new school, Conyers Adventist Academy. So I'm going to read the names twice for the members of the school board for this coming year. Pastor Sean Shias, Pastor Curtis Fox, Barbara Trumbull, which of course is our principal, Charles Walker, who has been nominated to be the board chairperson, the school board chairperson, Erica Charles, Karen Charles, Michael Brown, David Pope, Honora Williams, Sharon Russell, Zoe Griffith, Nathan Fowler, Fowler who of course I hear the other, Carlene Johnson, Keisha Smichael, James Sumter, and Fiona Watts. Again, Pastor Sean Shires, Pastor Curtis Fox, Barbara Trumbull, Charles Walker, Erica Charles, Karen Charles, Michael Brown, David Pope, Noor Williams, Sharon Russell, Zoe Griffith, Nathan Fowler, Carlene Johnson, Keisha Michael, James Sumter, and Fiona Watts. Thank you. That was the first reading. Good day, church. I'm here to do the transfers. There's one transfer out of Conyers Church. Lozelle Davis to the Stone Mountain, Seventh-day Adventist Church, Georgia. This is the second reading. Thank you. Do we have a motion to uh, allow this transfer? Second? All in favor say amen. amen. Any opposed say amen. It carries. We thank you for being here today. We ask God to bless you richly this week, and may you stay committed to Jesus. As we depart today, there will be some announcements on the board. We're not making announcements from here. You can watch the announcements as you prepare to leave.